So welcome, uh, everyone, to our, I'm going to say regularly scheduled, but maybe I should say irregularly scheduled Thursday afternoon uh, webinar uh, from Innovative Business Advisors. And uh, you've missed us for the last couple of weeks. Um, we have not been on. And part of it is because we're reassessing uh, what we're going to do with this topic going forward. Um, as uh, much of the challenge related to COVID and the programs related to COVID are coming to a close. Um, Steve, I'll share with you, uh, many of the organizations I belong to and the boards I sit on have not had a face-to-face -face meeting for a year. Well, in May, two of my boards, and then in October, one of my national associations will be together face-to-face -to -face for the first time. So I think everyone is becoming very comfortable with the fact that the vaccines are out there, that we have access to the vaccines, and we have a new feeling about meeting face-to-face. -to, -face. Um, to that end, we also are seeing these programs um, reach their maturity. I guess that would be a great way to say it. So I'm going to turn it over very quickly here to Steve, and Steve's going to share two things with you. One is he's going to give us an update, and this will be, is it going to be the penultimate or the ultimate, the final update on COVID, or we don't know for sure. It might be the penultimate we're, update we're, on COVID. We're hoping it's final. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see where we go from here, but there definitely will be a COVID update, and then Steve will share with you how we're going to approach communicating and updating our clients on a variety of topics going forward. So with that said, and, and not uh, really uh, kind of uh, spoiling the ending, so to speak, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it from here. Excellent. Thanks, Marquita. And we are very appreciative of uh, the time you give us every Thursday to, to host these webinars. Uh, and you just do a marvelous job. I look forward to this when we, when we get them together. And I'm looking forward to the next chapter of this. So it should be exciting. So folks, this will be probably the last time you see this particular title slide, um, the post-COVID PPP updates. What we're going to go over today is uh, where the programs stand. And things are getting ready to wrap up. So there's a lot of information that the SBA has put together about effectiveness of the programs. We're going to share a bunch of that, a little bit of an overview in each of the main programs that still remain, the PPP program, the EIDL, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, the Restaurant Relief, uh, the SBA Debt Relief Program, touch on employee retention tax credit, and then a couple of the other federal programs. And then we'll, uh, then we'll talk about what we've got planned into the future. So uh, with that, let me dive right in. The, you're going to see, um, I'm going to be sharing several SBA slides. They've done a nice job of putting together summaries of what they've done within the SBA lending environment. And as our audience is well aware, the vast majority of the funding has come through the Small Business Administration. So here is a slide that was effective as of April 25th. Give everybody a sense of where they are. If you will recall, when the uh, reauthorization for the Paycheck Protection Program happened in the end of December, December 27th. They reauthorized it for $284 billion. Um, as of the 25th, they have uh, committed to $248.5 billion. It is projected that uh, the program, the PPP funding, will not last until the end of May. Um, the program is due to expire at the end of May, as everybody's aware. Um, but um, but it certainly has fulfilled many of the objectives that uh, our, our legislators have established for it. And we'll cover some of those today. So you get a sense of right here, uh, total PPP dollars have been, you know, 770 billion. Uh, the second round funding, 248 and a half billion with uh, five and a half million new loans in that. So this will show you the, uh, the, the, cadence of the loans that have happened. Obviously, early in January when the program was renewed, uh, there was a lot of initial interest in that. And you can see the trend line over the last uh, four months has been that uh, it has been going down. Um, and at the same time, it's getting ready to reach its, uh, its full culmination. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of lending activity has happened. Um, we have certainly seen uh, a slowdown at the SBA in terms of their processing and responsiveness. Clearly, I think that's understandable. Their volumes have just been unbelievable. Um, back 
before January. You know, they'd done 30 years of activity in the prior nine months. You turn around and add that. Here's another 10 years of activity that they've done in this second round. And then they've got two new huge programs, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant and then this new Restaurant Revitalization uh, Grant program that they're running. And we'll talk more about those a little later in the in the overview today. So, um, so you can see uh, lots of activity, been pretty well received. Uh, this shows you that um, of the new money of the new 248 billion, about 51 billion of that was for those that elected to take first draw loans. So remember if um, you had not taken advantage of PPP in the earlier rounds before that, before the first draw of money ran out, you could go back and take your first draw. And then uh, if you already had a PPP loan, you could take a second draw. And even in this current environment, uh, those that were on the ball and that elected to you know, get the funds early, probably had time to do a second draw in the uh, four month period of time. So if you had planned this real well, um, you probably had that opportunity. Um, the key target that, that the new administration has focused on has been on the smallest of the small business communities. So they've had a real emphasis on those with 20 employees or less, companies of 20 employees or less, and they've had a real emphasis on what's called the low and moderate income zip codes around the country. So uh, they break that information out now, and you can see that they've been pretty effective. So Clearly those, the smallest of the small business and those in the uh, lowest income areas of our country probably needed the help, certainly is at least as bad as, as everybody else. And it was nice to see that the targeting has been effective in that regard. And we'll, we'll cover some more, uh, some more information about that as we move on. Um, this again, we'll talk to, if you focus on the right side of the screen, if uh, you'll remember, one of the other things that the current administration did is they, they did a s several set asides. So they made, they took blocks of money and set them aside specifically for um, employers that had 10 employees or less, specifically for uh, the lower and moderate income marketplaces, specifically for community financial institutions and um, for, you know, first time borrowers. So. Uh, clearly, all of those funds have been used, and it was probably a good thing that they that they did those set asides as well, and it certainly achieved the objectives that was established. This is kind of interesting. Back in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, back in round one, the vast majority of borrowers were not necessarily the smallest of the small. That, that I think motivated some of the action of the current administration to change focus a little bit. Um, but um, now what has occurred is that they're actually getting 96% of all the loans to employee, employers with 20 or fewer. And that's equating to about 53% of the total loan volume. So uh, gives you an, an opportunity to see how, it, how the loan volume breaks up by type of borrower, if you will, on this slide. And I always think it's a lot easier to read, uh, read the graphs than sometimes it is to read tables and numbers. Uh, and then loan size. Right now, the overall average loan size is about 48,000. And back in PPP round one, the average loan size was about 103,000. So again, you know, significant, change in focus here and uh, certainly has achieved the objective. Um, I think the other thing that's kind of key here that uh, at least um, in my eyes was, if you'll recall, the SBA came out and said for anybody that takes a PPP loan that would be two million or more, you can count on being audited as a borrower. And I think you can see here when you're only talking about 650 odd loans, probably the SBA has the wherewithal to audit all of those. But when you look at a total loan count of somewhere in the 5.2 million, uh, they probably don't have the ability to audit all of the loans. So uh, I think this was, this helps understand why the threshold was set where it was because there's a pretty significant fall off in loan applications once you get beyond $2 million.
The other cool thing is um, that this has been utilized in every state and territory within the United States. So um, clearly New York, Illinois, Texas, and California have gotten the lion's share of the money because that's where the lion's share of the population and the independent businesses are. But every state has benefited uh, to a significant amount by, uh, by this program. So it's kind of interesting to see how the money's flowed uh, around the country. And then um, the other thing that uh, the audience may uh, remember is under the new administration, they also sought to get a lot more demographic information from borrowers. And this is not a requirement, but when you actually do your application online, they added several questions to the application process to uh, try and get additional demographic information. And, and they are saying that, um, you know, they've had limited effectiveness in this area. Uh, clearly, people are electing not to answer that uh, by a margin of three or four to one. So um, interesting in that regard. The other thing I saw that I thought was kind of interesting as well is, um, you know, it, when you when you look at it, uh, I would say the African American community was very well represented in terms of PPP borrowers as well here. So. If you look at those that did identify, you know, a significant portion of that community did identify. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, that it, it is interesting to see how that worked out. I also found it a little surprising. I thought, and I'm, it'd be interesting to know whether um, the percentage of borrowers is, is uh, primarily two to one when it goes to male to female. If, if you would ask me, I would have suspected that females would probably be more inclined to answer the demographic questions. Uh, so, but um, kind of interesting data as you, as you see this stuff moving forward. Now that we talked about all the loans, uh, I thought our audience might also like to see the forgiveness side of the equation because there's been a lot of money out there and um, there is all of that money is potentially forgivable. So as of April 25th, and this goes back to the original PPP funding, actually round one, if you will, that was released in March of last year. There was about 5.2 million loans. So far, almost 3 million loans have been forgiven of that 5.2. Pretty astounding. That's uh, actually much, uh, much more than I expected. They currently have about 183,000 under review and they have not taken applications yet for forgiveness for 2.1 million loans, which is also surprising. So if you think back to the fact that that program ran basically from March through September of last year or March through August of last year, you know, everybody's had the opportunity to use those funds and, um, and are, are past, well past the period of, um, of needing to wait before applying for forgiveness. Now, um, there is no deadline for forgiveness. You can apply for forgiveness up until the time that your last loan payment is due. So, you know, there, there might be some misinformation about, out there about that, but you definitely have the right to apply for forgiveness up until your last loan payment is due. If you, if you pay off your loan, I think maybe you could even technically apply for forgiveness, but it, you know, might be more difficult at that period of time. But I, but if, if memory serves, I think you had to do it while the loan was still active. Uh, so pretty significant though, um, you know, uh, three out of five loans have applied for forgiveness and have been granted forgiveness. And then when you look at it from a dollar's perspective, it's almost half the revenue. So pretty, pretty significant amount of, uh, of revenue has been forgiven. And it's significant because that forgiveness also came with um, basically tax neutrality. So, you know, uh, originally everybody uh, and us included thought that those loans would be taxable, but they are not taxable. So uh, that turned out to be, you know, a, a real nice benefit to the borrowers in all of those uh, scenarios. And then this, uh, this just takes that information and plots it on a graph so you can see it visually, maybe a little more easier to to see and understand for our audience. But again, if, if you remember, you know, that the program ran out basically at the end of August uh, and you can see how the forgiveness applications have taken off over time as a result. So uh, 
pretty significant. Almost half the total volume has been forgiven to date. So that covers the PPP program. And any questions on that, Marquita? Anybody, anybody raise a hand or ask any questions regarding PPP? No, no questions pending right now. So let's move forward. Yeah, boy, we've talked about it so much. I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised. So let me talk a little bit about EIDL. So another program administered by the Small Business Administration. EIDL has been a long-term program. It's been in place for many, many years, obviously, primarily, uh, uh, designed to address natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, uh, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, uh, primarily weather events. Uh, but now, obviously, COVID made uh, that disaster was also uh, made made you eligible for EIDL, and there were 3.8 million loans and dispersed almost $200 billion in uh, EIDL. So, and EIDL funds are still available. You can still apply. There is funding available. Uh, so uh, that program will continue and will continue even after um, the, the whole rest of the pandemic aid uh, comes to an end. I know that uh, many borrowers over the course of the last couple of months have also received notices from the SBA that if you were an EIDL borrower and may have been limited in the amount of your loan or due to the fact that the pandemic went on much longer than expected, um, the SBA did send out an email to my understanding is virtually all borrowers that said if you need an additional tranche of money on your EIDL, here's a link to an application that you can uh, make and see if you would qualify for, for additional funding under the EIDL. These numbers would include all the funding, but they haven't broken out yet any detail to say what was, you know, what was part of, you know, what you might consider a round one, and then what might have been part of the lending uh, where the SBA went back out to borrowers and asked them if they needed more money. I would expect we may see some detail about that in the future, and uh, we'll continue to monitor the SBA uh, information and uh, we may include that in the in the future if something comes out along that line might be kind of an interesting data point for for folks like us that have kind of become um, uh, aid, aid, aid nerds over the course of the last year anyway so uh, this uh, also gives you a breakdown of how the funding worked out by borrower so on the left pie chart that is by loan count so again, you know, two thirds of the loans were less than $50,000. Kind of the interesting benchmark there was if you received a loan of less than $25,000, there was basically no um, UCC filing placed against your business, i.e. meaning that there was no lien placed against your business and there was no personal guarantee required. Uh, for loans of 50,000, and I believe the threshold and Marquita, maybe you remember. I think it was forty-five thousand where they where they went out and said that they've got a they're going to put a UCC recording out there. So, um, if anybody has an interest in that, we can go back and research it. But I didn't take the time ahead of this webinar to pull that information in. But again, I thought it was interesting that you know two thirds of loan volume was less than fifty thousand, uh, and. Um, yeah, you can you can see how it breaks down by the approvals, the approved dollar amounts as well. So, uh, pretty effective lending program. And then there was a lot of discussion about the advanced grants, and that program went quick. Um, I also understand that there were emails that went out to primarily those in the low and moderate income zip codes, EIDL borrowers that were in the low and moderate income zip codes, given the opportunity to receive a grant if they didn't receive one or potentially receive a larger grant if they may have received a small grant initially. And that was focused specifically on the low and moderate income uh, zip code recipients first. And my understanding, as you can see here, that those funds have been fully exhausted and dispersed. So, you know, Congress always has the right to add more money to the pot, but at this point in time, the, the pot is dry and there is no more money available for the EIDL grants. So that covers the EIDL. The next thing is the much anticipated shuttered venue operators grant application. And I took the liberty of making a screenshot earlier today 
The Shuttered Venue Operators Grant application program is now open and functioning again. So you guys may remember we announced a couple of weeks ago that they were going to open early in the month of April. The program opened for a couple of hours. The, basically, the program crashed. The, the separate website that they had put together crashed. And uh, the SBA has then spent the last three weeks uh, fixing that and getting it up and running and very quietly reopened it this week. So um, there is, um, a, it is a separate website. If you go to sba.gov um, and you... It, the, the, the home page of SBA has got COVID aid as the prominent feature. If you click on COVID aid, then it will show you all the programs that are available, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant being one of those, and it has a direct link. You click on it there. It takes you right to this website. And um, one of the interesting things on the website now is it's got a countdown co timer. If it'll, it'll show you if you do not have an application in process. Uh, it'll give you a time period when you can actually log in and register and begin your application process uh, if, in fact, the site is busy. If the site is not busy, it takes you right into the application process and you can do it online. Uh, the key thing here, though, is you should have been pre-registered under the SAM program and you will have to have uh, your SAM registration as part of the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant application. So be prepared for that up front. But program's up and running, and I'm sure the money is going to go relatively quickly in that program as well. The next new program is the Restaurant Revitalization Award Portal, which is, again, the grant programs available to food and hospitality operators, and um, they have done a uh, limited uh, release to some folks on an early basis, and now you have the opportunity to go in and you can you can go in and register and begin that. And they will let you know when they're ready to begin taking your application in this area as well. And uh, just like the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, you will have to be pre-registered in the, in the government SAM program in order to be able to finalize your application in the uh, restaurant revitalization portal. And again, just like I had talked about for the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, all you got to do is go to sba.gov, uh, go to the, click on to the COVID page, and you will see there is a prominent box for this program. You click the box and it takes you right to the dedicated website where, uh, where you can begin this process. The neat thing that they've done here is they've also added some, uh, some YouTube videos. So they've got some, they've got some instructional videos that you can watch, as you can see here in this image, uh, for you to begin the application process. So, uh, SBA's uh, really done some amazing things. And again, I think, uh, I think it's, it's just been fabulous uh, what that government agency has done for the American small business community. So it's open and running. Next, we're gonna talk about SBA debt relief. So one of the other things that um, was a core part of the original CARES Act was what they call SBA debt relief. So if you as a small business or, or even medium-sized business owner, if you had any SBA uh, loan programs out there, um, whether you might have used the 7A program, the 504 program for purchasing real estate or capital equipment, or even the microloan programs, um, the SBA had made it um, by default, they had suspended payments for six months for all folks that had existing SBA loans. And um, that was automatic. They notified uh, borrowers uh, via email and made payments directly to the lending institutions on behalf of the borrowers. So uh, the, the borrower got notified and the borrower's bank got notified that that was happening. The other thing that they did is going back to the EIDL, uh, whether that was for your home or your business, if you had an EIDL loan out there, uh, if there was an existing EIDL loan, you got a you got a 12 month deferment. If you took out a new EIDL loan during the course of this uh, pandemic, you received an initial 12 month deferment on the payment. And then uh, just a few months ago, they've notified all borrowers, and that has happened via um, my understanding is via email and via letter. 
that they have extended that deferment to an additional 12 month period of time. So all repayments on EIDLs won't happen until uh, 2022. Earliest would be March of 2022. So um, that's how the SBA views the debt relief program that they had available. Finally, let me move into employee retention tax credit. Um, and um, we are not experts in this area, um, but uh, wanted to give you just a quick overview. This program is still available. And uh, if your business would potentially qualify for this, it is in your best interest to um, actually make uh, make filing applications and, and determine whether or not your business would be uh, applicable. So there are three different ways you can qualify. And, you, and first off, you've got to have 500 employees or less. So um, if you have 501, that doesn't work. But if you have 500 or less, you are automatically eligible. But then you've got to cover the next hurdle. And, and one of these two things has to be true. Either your business had to be fully or partially suspended due to government orders living, limiting commerce, travel, or group size due to the, due to the COVID. Um, and an interesting sidelight to this is, let's say, for example, that you were a, a, a company that was a technology company or you were a service company like IBA and your people had the opportunity to continue to work from home and continue to do their job from home. Even if the government required you to close your business, but you could still do your work from home, that does not qualify your business as being fully or partially suspended. So if, if your employees can do the same work from home, don't need to go to the office to fulfill the requirements of their job, then uh, that's, that's a disqualifier. However, if your business has a what they call a significant decline in gross receipts, when you compare quarterly periods from 2019 to 2020, and that means that gross receipts fell by more than 20%, i.e. your gross receipts had to be you know, less than 80% of the prior quarter, that would be a qualifier for you. So even if your employees had to work from home or had the ability to work from home, but your business was still affected by revenues going down by 20% or more, then you would potentially uh, qualify for that. And then how much is the, uh, how much is the money? Well, for 2020, you were eligible for 50% of the first 10,000 of qualified wages for each of your employees. And that's a maximum of $5,000 per employee for the entire year 2020. But they changed that for 2021, and it is now 70% of, of the 10,000 unqualified wages, but it's based on a quarterly basis. So you could potentially receive up to $7,000 per quarter per employee. So it's a significant amount of money. And the way you actually file for the credit is you would, you would file it utilizing your uh, federal employment tax return form 941. 941 forms have been adjusted to um, provide information and boxes for you to fill in information regarding your employee retention tax credit. And it, you also can use the IRS form 7200 to receive an advance on that credit as well. So it's not just the fact that, um, you know, you can get a credit out there. If, if you are actually owed a credit, they will actually send you a check, which would be kind of nice. So Steve, let's stay on this for a quick minute uh, sure. for clarification. For the qualifications, is the Boolean operator here within the qualifications point one and point two and point three, or is it point one or point two or point three? Well, you have to, so you, it, it only applies to companies that have 500 or fewer employees, first mm -hmm. off. So that's number one. And then the, one of the next two has to, be the, has to be in place. So if you were either fully or partially suspended, you automatically qualify then. Okay. Whether or not you received a de significant decline in gross receipts. Okay, gotcha. Right? But if you were not fully or partially suspended, then you had to have a significant decline in gross receipts. Okay, so as a mathematician, I would put one... Point number one, open parens and open parens 
point number two or point number three, close parens. There you go. Right? <laughs> there you go. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okie doke. And then on the second one, the how much component mm -hmm. of it, we qualified. Now, if we qualified for the employee tax retention and we already received a PPP loan related to our employees, does uh, the PPP funds exclude our ability to take out the, or, or to qualify for this or can we do both? Great question. So originally in the CARES Act, you could not do both. Originally, you could only do the PPP or take advantage of the employee retention tax credit. In, in the uh, revised uh, um, ACC law that was passed December 27th, they removed that exclusion and said that effective December 27th, you could take advantage of both. So if you were advised by your, you know, trusted advisors, your payroll company, your accountants, your bookkeepers, et cetera, at the end of during 2020, that you could not take advantage of both that you had to choose. Um, now you can go back and retroactively apply for what was due you in 2020. Great. Good to know. So it's a, um, it's a significant uh, amount of money out there that's available, and uh, obviously it doesn't doesn't apply to, to everybody. Um, the payroll providers are well versed in this stuff. If you use a payroll provider, I'm sure they can provide you with much more clarity than we can. We don't prof don't profess to be experts in the employee retention tax credit, but I wanted to call out that it is a significant form of aid that will be available to businesses through the end of 2021. And this is one of the few programs that's going to go through the end of the year. So remember, PPP runs out the end of May. Uh, if the funding is still there, which uh, SBA expects that they will not have funding to go to the end of May, um, PPP runs out then. EIDL is still available. EIDL Advance Grant has already run out. Um, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant just opened. They're expecting that that is going to go very, very quickly as well. Uh, and then the Restaurant Revitalization Act just opened as well. And again, they're expecting those grants are probably going to go pretty quickly. Employee retention tax credit is not constrained by a budget amount of money. So this will be open through the end of the year and available for all businesses in that regard. And then finally, I want to call out the a couple of other uh, key things. A lot of business owners that we talk with are really concerned about the federal unemployment assistance programs because people are getting, you know, a significant bonus to their unemployment checks. And thus, um, you know, there are very few applicants out there in the job market. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of employers are looking to hire at this point in time. The federal unemployment assistance is scheduled to end September 6th. So remember, you if if you um, if you were on unemployment, you were only eligible for I think seventy nine total weeks of unemployment, and uh, the program from the federal subsidy standpoint, the what is now three hundred dollars extra a week in addition to whatever your state level of unemployment is, that program will run out September sixth. So. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of businesses out there that wish it would run out a lot sooner and hope to hopefully get people back into the job market. Uh, you know, we've talked to a lot of folks that have got uh, entry level employees. And frankly, you know, the McDonald's in our markets are actually giving you $50 if you'll come in and make an application. So uh, we're seeing a lot of that in, um, in a lot of the, you know, entry level positions out there. We were talking with one of our manufacturing clients the other day, and, you know, they said they've been advertising for entry level folks in their facility for months and haven't had a single application. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs and, and everybody's hope is that once that, that, uh, additional unemployment assistance runs out, that that'll begin to change. The other thing is the, um, the CDC extended the eviction ban until June 30th. So, you know, um, once, uh, once that eviction ban, uh, is up, 
you know, there might, there might also be a need for folks to go out there and, and generate additional income, right, to get caught back up on their rent and things like that, if in fact, uh, they took advantage of the, uh, of the ban and maybe, you know, pinched their pennies through the pandemic and, and didn't make their rent payments. So there is, um, there is some hope out there that the, that the, the, at least the entry level job market may begin to uh, to have some folks that are out there seeking jobs again at some point this summer. So wanted to call that out and let folks know exactly when those programs end. All right. So I think uh, I think that catches catches everybody up on the programs as a whole. We're basically unless there's some significant change that comes up, we're going to get out of talking about COVID relief. We've been doing it for <laughs> about, uh, what, 14 months now. And, um, and um, I know that uh, it hopefully has helped some folks out there. And we are always going to be available if folks have any particular questions uh, that come up. But we're going to change our focus. We're going to change our focus in terms of pivoting to a thriving scenario again. So, and we are going to continue a webinar series, but our future webinar, we're going to focus on specific resources for business owners and things that business owners can do to, you know, deal with some of the challenges that are currently in the marketplace and, and get to the point where they're thriving again, if they're not already in that, in that, uh, particular position. We've got some folks that are going to come on and uh, and provide some specific emphasis on some case studies that we'll be able to provide for you. And then we've got a whole business inter business owners interview process that we're going to be bringing you. So we've got uh, several business owners that are in the community that are going to come on and talk about uh, how they've uh, coped with these things, share their stories, share some of their insider tips and secrets and and uh, things that have worked well for them and some of the lessons that they've had and hopefully uh, hopefully make our community much uh, much more informed and uh, potentially even entertained as we move forward. So Marquita and I are pretty excited about this and I think it's uh, we focus so much on aid for the last uh, you know many months we're looking forward to focusing on opportunity again and uh, we hope that you guys will continue to stay with us and share this with your friends and um, and hopefully there will be something in it for everybody as we move into the future. And Steve, one thing I might add now is we have a fairly robust list as we sit right now of business owners who will be sharing um, their stories and information with us. However, we know that list will run out at some point in the future. So because many of you on this phone are trusted advisors, uh, partners, and business owners, uh, if you have an interest in, in joining us here to tell your story or share any specific information with us, we welcome it. So uh, shoot a note uh, back to Steve. It will get to Steve if you follow the links that are in our YouTube channel. And uh, we, we'd be interested to hear from you. Oh, very much so. We'd love it. So, yeah, thank you, Marquita, for calling that out. I think, uh, I think that'd be great. So, um, folks, that's it for our overview today. Um, you, you know how to reach us. I'll put our resources back up here. We're at InnovativeBA.com. You can, you can catch up with us in social media in any of these places. Of course, we'll always have the replay uh, on our YouTube channel under the COVID-19 playlist. Uh, looking forward to starting a new playlist and uh, having some uh, exciting, uh, exciting folks uh, into the future here. And then... Um, you can also go to uh, to our you don't know what you don't know dot com site and pick up any of the any of the books in our series. We've got two out now. We've got a third that's going to be released this summer, and uh, excited about uh, additional materials that we'll have in that area as well. And then finally, let me call out our CEO to CEO coaching platform. So, if uh, if you or someone within your circle that can benefit by really understanding the numbers at a much higher level within their own existing business and how to truly deliver a uh, uh, an amount of financial literacy that can help them really accelerate the performance of their business, that's what CEO to CEO is all about. And we'd be happy to engage with you in any of those places. So thank you folks so much for your attention. Uh, Marquita, any questions or comments from our from our audience this week? No questions. We've got several people uh, putting in notes. Thank you. Thank you. Great information. Look forward to the future format. So with that said, Steve, I think we're going to bid adieu today and uh, keep an eye out for our emails and the scheduling for our uh, 
carry forward webinars. Yep, you're going to see the headers and the formats of those notes are going to change a little bit in the future. So uh, if they look a little unusual to you, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully you'll continue to pay attention to them. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here in the weeks to come. Marquita, thanks so much for uh, all that you do to make this successful and make it a great day. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye.